This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. What the hell's going on, everybody? Wow. A little bit late uh, tonight. But we still have the goal. That's the key, isn't it? Yeah, the uh, reason I was a little bit late, uh, I was doing, had construction, well, you know, the work that I'm having done on the garage. The, uh, you know, <clears throat> The guy that does it, he's like a high school friend of mine. He's doing it. And um, he, like he was do using, I can't remember which saw it was, the table saw, and he it jerked and, poof, and he went right into his finger, like the tip of his finger, pretty much ripped off the whole top of it, like most of his fingernail, the whole thing. It's just like meat there. It's crazy. So he had to come in, and we put some stuff on it i mean he's been doing this for like 20 30 40 years and he has never done that so one time he hurt his finger one time but uh man this was like he's gonna probably need surgery so it's probably gonna set it back a couple weeks but you know i've been waiting 15 years it, that doesn't matter to me he needs to get that healed up it sucked yeah it was like bleeding all over the place came in the house we had to put the some stuff on it and then he just called me just a second ago to tell, say what it was. So he's gonna have to see a doctor really quick, uh, maybe do surgery on it, and uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's really shitty. Yeah. So, what's going on? Yeah. So I'm not really sure. Uh, like tonight, I was going to do my this show, but then I was thinking of going out to the crime scene live and so forth. But I don't know. It always seems I don't know how to communicate with the camera facing out, and I wouldn't be able to read anybody's comments. Plus, I have a goal up there to meet, and whenever I do those live streams, it just disappears off the face of the earth. So I was just, you know, I don't know. And I have a, let's see. No, I probably won't call him that. Yeah. So they, they came up with this. Hold on. Yeah, so the cops address online rumors after... It wasn't just online rumors. It was on the news, okay? After six Oregon women are found dead. And this is on some site called Newsbreak Portland, but I don't know, you know, I don't know who... I guess it's at... Let's see. Maybe it's in the Oregonian. There it is. No connection between cases of six women... Found dead in recent months, most in secluded wooded areas, police say. I mean, I don't know how you know that without, you know. <laughs> Officials found the bodies of six women, February, unless you tell you solve it. February 19th and May 7th, 2023, left to right, then bottom left, bottom right, Kristen Smith, Joanna Speaks, Charity Perry, unidentified women, Bridget uh, Webster, Ashley Real, the Portland... Police Bureau says the cases are not related. Portland Police Bureau and Multnomah, Polk, Clark, and Clackamas counties. 
The police, the Portland Police Bureau says there's no connection between the cases of the six women who were found dead within 100 miles of each other, all but one in the Portland area over the past three months. The cases of the women, all under the age of 40, are being investigated by the Portland Bureau and Sheriff offices in Multnomah, Polk, Clark, and Clackamas counties. Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Like the earlier shift, it's always like it, what's cool is on the early show, uh, the freaks are, you know, it's just sort of like this continual support and chatting and, you know, super chats and everything, like throughout the entire time. But when you do these, sometimes lately during the night shows, it's uh, been kind of a, a little nervous. So. Let's see. Got to get the names in there. There we go. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> well, I mean, you, half of you are in the day show, too, so that's probably part of it. But. Uh, let's see. The cases of the women all under the age of 40 are being investigated by Portland Police Bureau and those other agencies. Uh, the Police Bureau said rumors have been flying on social media, stoking anxiety in the community about how the cases may be related. We want to provide reassurance that the speculation is not supported by the facts available at this point. Police said in a press release on Sunday, while any premature death is concerning, the Portland Police Bureau has no reason to believe these six cases are connected. I don't know, man. I mean, just the circumstances alone. Yeah, when they say no reason to believe, what does that mean, though? They, I mean, all it means is that they don't have any, anything conclusively linking them. We've seen that before in other cases where it turns out they were related, and people say, oh, we don't think they're connected. I don't know. I think uh, four of them, to me, seem similar. But it could just be miraculously that all these women were dying right around the same time. Yeah, who knows. Uh, if we learn of an, uh, let's see, articulable danger, we will notify the public about it. Authorities found the bodies of the six women between February 19th on May 7th, most, most in wooded or secluded rural areas, one body with, uh, which police identified as Kristen Smith, 22, was found in a wooded area in southeast Portland, Pleasant Valley neighborhood. Another identified as that of Joanna Speaks, 32, was found. But every, every one of these people, though, has sort of a past, though, that can kind of, you know, might come to haunt them later. You know, so it's not, it's not really, that's the part that makes you go, man, yeah, God. But all of them at the same time? I don't know about that. Anyways, my normal spiel is every single night on this channel, uh, the freaks help support the channel. I got the goal up on the top of the screen there. And then there's a super freak over there after any $20 combination uh, somebody else takes over the super freak spot and uh, then uh, at the end of the month and sometimes during the month uh, from the income from the channel I send in large amounts of money to various charities out there from the income all right so you guys are the sole income for the channel but when I do these live streams there's no ad revenue even if they play ads for you there's none for me <laughs> Okay, that's just the way it is. All right. Um, officials found another dead woman in a tent near Interstate 205. See, I think that was just like a homeless person that died of drugs. That's the one. The, the Native American one is the one that's a little bit of a outlier, completely different than the others. I also think Kristen Smith might not be either because she did mention you know, some sort of abusive situation and she went missing way before, but then there's these other four that all went missing around the same time from generally the same area. And then they're all found dumped far away. So we're just gonna say that all four of them had violent boyfriends at the same time that decided to kill 
kill them and then dump their bodies somewhere? Or do they... Uh, it would probably help if they told us what the cause of death was. Yeah, maybe a drug overdose, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were, like, staying over at people's... I mean, I, I interviewed the lady who said that, remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so these are the locations here. I mean, I was thinking of maybe going out there, but, I mean, is it worth... I mean, I, I, mean, I guess we could go there, because each one of these cases are separate you know i mean i'd like to go to the one in uh the joanne speaks location uh there's also kristen smith and ashley real out there in eagle creek area these other ones are hard to determine mm -hmm. No, it wasn't really hidden. It just wasn't, you know. I mean, here's the thing. If they didn't think they were connected from the get-go, then they're not going to make a big story over it. But then one of them said, oh, my God, there's five of these girls. And then boom, 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 it turned into this bigger case. Uh, it's been covered. All Every one of the cases has been covered because I went over the news articles related to them. It's just people aren't interested in cases that look like they're just one-off drug sort of cases. All right. All, every one of these cases has been covered. People just aren't paying attention to them. Right? That's the truth. I just went over and showed you yesterday and the day before all of the different articles that go over and discuss the right when they happen and another one or two after that. Well, then those people in those Portland folks are idiots like they are, uh, Danielle. I'm, I'm telling you, I went over the articles. So if they hadn't heard of it, that's their fault. It was on news outlets and everything. Yeah, and or, or they just weren't paying attention or cared. I mean, the thing is, is um, I didn't hear much about it because I'm doing national news and sort of these larger stories, and these are just kind of these local stories that aren't really... It wasn't until somebody said... Well, we actually, we did. We covered Kristen Smith before it became part of the serial killer case. So we did do one of them. The other ones are smaller. All right. There's a lot of people in Portland still haven't heard of uh, the Delphi case or something. They, they just, nobody, they're just doing their own thing. Well, that's the update on that. Maybe it'll just be a, this might be a real short one tonight. I can just, like, the, the vibe isn't good. So we also had the, there was a missing Gretchen Fleming from, we did it, we covered that back in December last year. So the updates, I'm just going to go back in time a little bit. So there's a West Virginia musician, 28, is still missing nearly a month after she was last seen, extremely drunk. With a with older man with white hair at a bar, Gretchen Fleming, 28, was last seen in early hours of December 4th. A 28-year-old musician from West Virginia has been missing for nearly a month after vanishing during a night out. Gretchen Fleming disappeared from her from the My Way Lounge and Restaurant in Parkersburg. See, we, I remember covering that because it's a little thin. Um, Let's see, that's Fleming. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, you remember that? This place right here? This is where she was. Uh, Gretchen's high school friends have organized vigils that have brought the community together as they hope for her safe return. Jake Grimm told Dateline, the case rattled him immediately. He said no one has been, no one has seen any camera footage of anything. Uh, she was at multiple spots, you know. The last place she was seen to everyone was the My Way, he added. Nothing that, uh, noting that despite Weeks passing by, there's no timeline of the night yet. It seems like she was going to uh, multiple different places that night, but no one has confirmed that she was wearing, what she was wearing, or how she was getting around. Thank you, Cindy J. And, oh yeah, and congrats for Cindy J. She retired today, finally. That all the kids are like, thank God, Jesus. Um, excellent. <laughs> yeah, but also, let's see, it seems like she was going to multiple places. Uh, Gretchen's father, David Fleming, previously told Dateline, we love her. Something happened to her. I don't know what to say. Tomorrow would be her 28th birthday. He said on December 23rd, she's an amazing little girl. I just want her home. Well, thanks, uh, Kathy Chapin, who's also a you know, big supporter on the earlier show. <laughs> Thank you very much. Allie Cake and Sarah Beth Colagras. Uh, she's I don't know what that is. On December 15th, the police executed a search warrant on a Parkersburg house and said they were executing multiple search warrants based on leads and tips that have come in since her disappearance. Since speaking with Dateline, Grimm told Daily Mail, not much has changed moving on the investigator investigatory front. The cops are investigating and we just want her information out there and for everyone all around and over to know she is and God who she is and that she is missing. Alright, so we got that. That that was originally, so if we move forward in time, maybe go to like uh January. These are all stuff uh updates we never got here. West Virginia finds suspected human remains two hours from where missing woman last seen, but turns out that these weren't hers because she's still missing. Let's see. Uh, Parkersburg Police Lieutenant James Stallnaker previously told Fox News Digital that an unnamed male is a person of interest. He is a person of interest in the investigation. We know she left with him. We believe that she traveled back to his residence with him. He's given inconsistent statements. Through his own admission, she was at one point in his vehicle. <laughs> but he's claiming she didn't make it to his house. See, this is where it just gets stupid, right? Thank you, Circa Then. Around that time. Around that time. Uh, Stalkmaker also said that Fleming left her purse at the bar, which held her phone as well as debit and credit card. Hmm. There's no indication they knew each other prior to that night. Uh, through his own admission, she was at one point in his vehicle, but he's claiming she didn't make it to his house. There's no indication they knew each other prior to that night. Well then, wow, did he drug her or something? I mean, why would she... I mean, miraculously, she doesn't have her purse on the one night she's abducted permanently. Stallnaker also said that Fleming left her purse at the bar, which held her phone as well as debit and credit cards. Hmm. According to police, Fleming showed up at the bar with a different person. Hmm. That's a little weird. Uh, 
which one is this? This is the uh, sixth. <coughs> Uh, finder, Gretchen Fleming's grandmother shares emotional update in search for missing granddaughter. The heart, this is February 5th. Her heartbroken grandmother of a missing, or the heartbroken grandmother of a missing woman who vanished after a night out has shared an emotional update on her granddaughter's disappearance. Gretchen Fleming, 28, left the My Way Lounge in Park, Parkersburg, West Virginia with an older man on December 4th and has not been seen or heard from since. Man, that's just nuts. Yesterday marked two months since she vanished, prompting hundreds of volunteers to join police in a ramped up community search. Due to the large area that we'll be checking, we thought it would be beneficial to have as many people as we could, could to help with the search. We initially called for 300 people just for concerns of the safety of the searchers, but we were able to facilitate enough group leaders through the help of the community with that as well as covering a few areas as well, so it was tremendous. According to Gretchen's grand grandma, Louise Fleming, approximately 500 people were in attendance. Uh, here's a person of interest. The man who Gretchen was last seen with is considered to be a person of interest after he told cops Gretchen had been in his car that night. The man who is in his 50s, so he might have thought that, oh, they've got, got her getting into my car, but so this guy, you know, <laughs> he did it, right? Let's just be honest here. It's uh, This guy knows exactly what happened to her. There is no doubt. What do you mean, Greg? Well, listen, he leaves the bar with her. Her purse is at the bar. And he admits that she was in his car and somehow she just disappeared, right? And some other person did something. The man who was in his 50s has not, however, been named as a formal suspect and investigators have so far kept his identity under wraps. Cops have since, however, obtained search warrants for the man's car, home, electronics. That's why they were doing those search warrants in that town. According to Eyewitness News, he is a former... You know what? I think, though, it's possible that an alien spacecraft beamed her out of the vehicle. Now, if you can refute what I just said, do it. But I think it's very likely that an alien spacecraft beamed her out of the, the vehicle and we just haven't caught it, the, you know, seen it yet on radar. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Let's see. <clears throat> According to Eyewitness News, he is a former law enforcement... Ooh, wait. Cops have since, however, obtained search warrants for the man's car, home, electronics, and other homes he might rent or own. According to Eyewitness News, he is a former law enforcement officer at multiple departments in West Virginia. Oh, boy. So did he use that when he was in the bar, saying, hey, listen, I'm here undercover. I gotta get you. I got you to get you out of here really quick. Something's going down. Hey, here's my badge. Hey, hey, hey. Oh boy. He is said to have had law enforcement career that spanned about 12 years and ended with a stint at the Billington Police Department in Barber County. The person of interest has not been charged with any crimes in connection to Gretchen's case. Gretchen was 27 when she disappeared and turned 28 on Christmas Eve. And it is heartbreaking plea her dad and in a heartbreaking plea her dad David Fleming told WTAP she's an amazing little girl she's very independent you know she's my little girl everybody that came in uh, sight with uh, with her loved her multiple search warrants have been executed in connection with the investigation Police are also asking all residents in the area to review home surveillance footage. They believe the vehicle may have traveled through the Parkersburg area between the early morning hours of December 4th to noon on December 5th. Fleming had recently accepted a job at a nearby H&M and lived with her grandmother in a nearby home. She stands 5 feet 2, brown eyes and brown hair. 
Police are asking uh, anyone with more information on her location to call Detective J.M. Zimmerman at 304-424-1072. And there's another one on February 17th. A closer look. Finding missing Parkersburg, West Virginia woman. The search continues for a Parkersburg woman missing since December 2022. Parkersburg police say they have a person of interest, but may many questions remain, including where Gretchen Fleming is now. Hundreds of volunteers helped with the search earlier this month. Let's see. It, it took her to a mall to drop her off for work. So let's see. But she hasn't been seen since her granddaughter, Gretchen Fleming's, pretty face in person since she saw her on December in December of 2022 I took her to a mall to drop her off for work on Saturday December 3rd at about 1 15 p.m. Louise Fleming said she never came home that night but once in a while but once in a while she'd go to a friend's and stay for two or three days I didn't think anything of it because she was 27 years old but then she didn't come home Fleming was living with Louise. Her family officially reported her missing just over a week later. As a couple of days had went by, uh, a week had went by, they became concerned, said Detective James Zimmerman. That's when they contacted us to do the investigation and object, and obviously through that we did have a week behind. We did have a week behind, what? But we've made progress through the investigation. People saw Fleming out of town the night of December 3rd. She left behind her purse and everything in it. She just kind of vanished from a local bar hangout area. Parkersburg police say they have surveillance video of Gretchen Fleming leaving the, May, uh, the My Way Lounge with the person that is now considered a person of interest. The last time that we could definitely put her at a location or with someone was December 4th during the early morning hours, said Parkersburg Police Chief Matt Board. So shortly after getting that timeline together, they were able to make contact with that person that she was last seen with during the early morning hours and speak with them. He said investigators have executed several search warrants. Ultimately, we executed a multitude of search warrants pertaining to the person of interest, being as it, uh, his residence and off-site location that he has access to a vehicle and multiple electronic devices. Hmm. I didn't dream there would be... This. Okay, that's the search part. Okay. Alright, so let's see what the more, most recent one in like May... Man, we're just really nailing that goal up there. Parkersburg PD waiting on DNA and forensic evidence to come back. Ooh, will that DNA show something? No, nah, I don't want to bring I'm not going to talk about his name. Five months since the missing persons report for Gretchen Fleming was filed on December 12th, Parkersburg police are still waiting on information and evidence to be examined. Uh, Parkersburg Police Detective James Zimmerman says forensic and DNA evidence is still being examined at the West Virginia Crime Lab. Zimmerman says he has been in contact with the state lab on a weekly basis and is hoping to get answers soon. Detective Zimmerman also says there has been more progress in the case, he says, is painting a better picture of what happened the night Gretchen went missing. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, who, who are you talking to, Cindy? <laughs> God, you're just such a ridiculous person sometimes. Zimmerman says he has been in contact with the state lab on a weekly basis and is hoping to get answers soon. Detective Zimmerman also says there has been more progress in the case. He says is painting a better picture of what happened the night Gretchen went missing. 
So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll get some more answers from DNA and some other evidence that's being analyzed. Hopefully we'll have some answers soon, said Zimmerman. Now Zimmerman says there has been more search warrants conducted within the last few weeks. Zimmerman says he has shared the information with Gretchen's family throughout the case. Let's see. Well, there you go. That's, uh, I, I'm not going to put bring somebody's name up that isn't been named in articles or something. Yeah, well, they're not, so. You can send it to me on Messenger, though. <clears throat> well, I don't really think of it like there's a night crew and a day crew. It's just been kind of cool during the day. You know, it's like a, uh, so it's pretty cool. But you can give me the name on Facebook so I can look it up. I don't, I'm not going to put his name out on an art in, on a show though. But I'd like to look him up later so I can look, see what he's all about. Right, right. Oh, she's had a few drinks. Well, there you go. There you go. Okay, well, we'll, we'll forgive you there, Cindy. But how about just put some duct tape over your or your fingers so you can't type, okay? You're, you say you, a lot of times when you've had a couple, it's just, whew, you know, loose lips sink ships. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's been awesome having two streams. Of, yeah, well, I, I guess so, but, you know, look at the night stream. <laughs> ah, what's this other one? Well, this is, an, uh, well, you know what I was going to show you? Remember the other night when we played the newspapers.com game and there was the one where a body found in a locker and I went back and looked at it that that was this, this really crazy story of this husband who like something happened and he just killed his wife and then cut her up into little bits and put her into four different bags and, and in a locker hmm Yeah. I've been drinking. Yeah, but she's not with you, Cindy, so. All right, so this is uh, from 1990. This is a, a different story, not that one. But this one's one of another obvious case, but they're not able to make the arrest. Right, so it's um, in Dallas, Texas. Husband finds his wife shot, son strangled. A Dallas man spent an evening in shock, a neighbor said, when he came home from work to find his wife fatally bludgeoned and their four-year-old son strangled to death. A 15-month-old son was uh, wandering around the family's ransacked South Dallas home. And this is the family right here. Kind of a blurry picture, but these are the two that were killed. And this kid was wa wandering around. And this is the husband. Uh, so it's sort of interesting because the only reason, as soon as you hear the story, what do you think? Uh, the four-year-old was killed because at four you can speak. Thanks, K-Me. You can speak at four. And you could recognize people. The 15-month-old was killed, wasn't killed because he can't say anything. You know, uh, 
the memory of a child like that wouldn't be credible. The four-year-old would be able to. So what, who is he, a person that would do that? Well, you would think that um, a, somebody very close to the family <laughs> would be the one that would kill in that way because it wasn't like the four-year-old was killed because he had to be killed for identity purposes. The 15-month-old wasn't killed because he couldn't. And the mother was killed because that was the, the target. Now you can't say it because I'm, I'm onto a different story. If you send me a link, I'll bring it up later. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just send me a link on Facebook and I'll, I'll put it out there. Man, you guys just, it's so hard for people to move on to the next case, you know. All right, look at, uh, so that's what I think, you know, and as soon as you read that, you, you it comes to mind, normally anyways, right? Let's see. Hey, Cindy, go, go drink somewhere else and come back later, okay? Thanks. You're just odd. Strange hearts for what? Uh, that there was a link? <laughs> yeah, so if you uh, send me the article, Zozo, and then after I get through this one, I'll circle back to that. I was thinking of maybe driving out to one of the scenes tonight, but I don't, I don't feel like it. So anyways, an autopsy report from the Dallas Medi uh, County Medical Examiner's Office determined Mrs. Pettit died of numerous blows to her head. Another son, 15-month-old Adam Pettit, was not harmed. So it doesn't sound like right there, strangulation, it's not as painful, but it's brutal because it takes a while. But then the mother gets bludgeoned to death. You see what I'm saying? Homicide detective J.S. Brezeno and Steve L. Hollier said a window on the front of the house had been forced open, but Brezeno said officers could not determine a motive for the crime. There have been several burglaries in the neighborhood near Joe Pool Lake in recent months. Man arrives home, finds his son four, wife slain. So there's another one. Dallas man spent an evening in shock. Okay, that's exactly the same. So let's go to this one. Uh, so then there was a, a benefit fund has been established to help the family of Dallas woman and her son found dead at their home. Brad Pettit, that's the husband, 33, returned home from work at Entex Sales and Service in Fort Worth and discovered the bodies of his wife. Valerie Pettit, 33, and son Matthew, 4, police said. The couple's 15-month-old son, Adam Pettit, was unhurt. The fund has been established at the Employees Federal Credit Union at Dallas, blah, 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 blah. So anyways, they, you know, they give the father's name here, and people are setting up a fund for them. Then on... I think this is kind of a, let me turn the audio. Can be sometimes a challenge. A challenge Dallas detectives have decided to face head on. The crime still shocking, though decades have passed. Last night, Brad Pettit came home to discover his wife, Valerie, and their four-year-old son dead. Seasons have come and gone. Families have moved in and out. But the mystery remains, and there's now a renewed sense of commitment to some well, the four-year-old could just merely have said that he was, he was actually home because apparently there's an alibi that he was at work and, you know, law enforcement said that it's possible he could have killed them before he went to work. So he might have gone to work, but he killed them. And then when he came home from work, he's like, oh, my God. But it seems like that would have been really obvious for detectives to be able to determine that they were died hours and hours earlier. So. Solving these murders. 
Valerie Pettit was 33 years old, her son Matthew just four. On February 8, 1990, they were found dead inside their house on Timber Bluff Circle. Valerie beaten to death, Matthew strangled. The house appeared to be ransacked. There was a front window that had been broken out. There was a screen uh, that, that had been torn. Kristen Lauman is assistant director of public information for the Dallas Police Department. She says a fresh set of eyes are on the case. Still, there's the matter of time. It's 30 years later. Uh, it's locating for this detective, locating people that were named are the... Yeah. So, let's see. There's actually this video of a... Like an old video that I found on a archive website. Inhabited by young families, toys litter front yards. And before yesterday, many of the people here lived by an open door policy. But today, everyone stayed behind closed doors, afraid to talk, especially to the media. They I mean, said the killer that, might see... I think it's weird that a story like that wasn't bigger. them on TV and hey, come back. You, Mickey Everybody's just real upset about what happened. Last night, Brad Pettit came home to discover his wife Valerie and their four-year-old son dead. Originally, police thought she had been shot. It turns out someone beat her about the head. The boy was strangled. Police still have little information about what happened and no suspects in custody, but they feel confident this case is solvable. And we're always optimistic. It's, it's too early in the investigation for us to be disappointed. They spent the day making a routine search of everything in and around the Pettit home, including Mr. Pettit's truck. The crime has residents calling for increased police protection. The neighborhood is part of the Dallas Police Department's beat number 435. It stretches all the way from Oak Cliff to Cedar Hill. One squad car patrols it. Residents say that's not enough. But police say that one squad car stays primarily in the Woods neighborhood since it's just about the only residential section in the area. Dallas police say they will increase their presence in beat area 435 and they'll send a representative down there to talk to the residents. They say they'll keep up their efforts until a sense of calm and security returns to the neighborhood. Sherry Woodard, Texas News 5. And I, that's kind of cool to have a, an archive like that. But apparently he had an alibi at work, but they think it could have happened before he went to work. And I think that's really the answer to the story. And he hasn't been, he hasn't cooperated with police since then. So there you go. Not this case, but that was a really short one. They're looking for the public's help currently, so. Thought I'd put it out there. Okay, so here's the article here that Zozo had. Parkersburg police confirm officers revisited the home of a person of interest in the disappearance of a woman from Vienna who hasn't been seen in a month. As of Wednesday, Chief Matthew Board would not publicly identify the person of interest in the investigation into the disappearance of Gretchen Fleming, but announced the case had a person they were interested in last week. Thank you, Lisa Murphy. <laughs> Let's get it done, she said. Yeah, we'll see. Ocean wave, ocean wave, ocean wave. Let's get her done. The person has not been officially named a suspect in the case. Eyewitness News confirmed through multiple sources, uh, however, that the man at the center of the investigation is Preston Pierce, 55, of the Parkersburg area. Pierce, whose name... Here, let me check something out here. Parker's. God, it's weird because it feels like I had this name earlier. Like it was just part of a. It's strange.
this second. I'm trying to find that house right there. I think I've got it. We'll see. Oh, so he's right there. Oh, wow. So that's the bar right there, and this guy lives right here. Yeah. Getting it done a little more. <laughs> well, thanks, Lisa Murphy. It's going to take a team effort. That's for sure. Yeah, so I think that's the house they're looking at, right? That's just from behind it. Yeah, so there, somebody got a drone out from behind. Yeah, this is Preston Pierce. I'm gonna check a couple other things. Yeah, it doesn't say what his uh, profession is, but we heard that he was a police officer, right? Okay, so eyewitness news confirmed through multiple sources, however, that the man at the center of the investigation is Preston Pierce, 55, of the Parkersburg area. Pierce, whose name was previously Daryl Lott, is a former law enforcement... Well, you might change your name if you were a, um, like, uh, you know, worried that people would be after you. Daryl Lott is a former law enforcement officer in multiple departments in West Virginia. According to law enforcement... Uh, professional Standards Information Systems Record. Okay, let me, let me see this name then. Can't be more than one person with that name. Yeah, it says he's 55 2. Daryl Eugene Lott. And if I go to jobs, there's not list one. And this one says v Vienna. I think it's the same address even. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on a second. Wow, the other address is right over here. I think it's the same person. 55-year-old Daryl E. Lott. It's got to be the same person, right? Born November... Yeah, and he was born November. Mm -hmm. So two guys, 55 years old with those two names. So this is his other house. Uh, oh, God. Damn, you guys. Yeah, there are a lot. <laughs> Man, what in the hell's going on here? This is the other one. So quiet. Oh, thanks, Caligal3. I guess I missed that one. And very kind, very kind. Didn't make any noise for some reason. I didn't hear it.
But thank you, Cali Gal Three. Man, this is uh, the windows popping up and round and around. It just drives me nuts. So right here, turn to the right. That's that one, I think. Yeah, it's not that one. So kind of an odd setup there with that wall. Two thousand twelve. <clears throat> How come I can't see that wall later? So there's a brick wall right there, right? And there's still a brick wall. This is May twelfth, and if I go like this. And then that it's this house over here, right? Oh, maybe it is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, I think I got confused. This one right here. <clears throat> Delva Johnson, thank you. That UFO out of there. All right, so he went by another name, previously Daryl Lott, and I wonder when he changed that name. For example, if he changed that name, well, I mean, he could have done it prior because he knew he was going to commit crimes, but uh, if he changed afterwards, he did it because he didn't want people to look him up, even though he knew police knew who he was. And he'd been referenced as a former police officer, so wanted to change his name to some random name like Daryl Lott, or from Daryl Lott to Preston Pierce, so that people would be like, oh, they wouldn't know that he worked there. That's not the name, it's the other name. Yeah, that's the name I want. None. Is there only one L though? I didn't see that. No. Former law enforcement officer at multiple departments in West Virginia, according to law enforcement professional standards information systems record. He had a law enforcement career that spanned about 12 years and ended with a... St See, I feel like I've read this, that 12-year part. Was that up here? Yeah, see, I did read that earlier. There was an article that I... that I, it, it got me going on to somewhere else, and then I lost the article. <laughs> it was like, oh, shit. 12 years and ended with a stint in at the Bellington Police Department in Harbor, in Barber County. Pierce had not been charged with any crime in connection to the Fleming case. Board confirmed the person of interest left My Way Lounge and restaurant with Fleming late into the night on December 3rd or early morning hours of December 4th. Ten months for it with a... <laughs> Look at this idiot here. Women arrested for allegedly leaving child with stranger for 10 months. But isn't it also weird that the stranger had the child for 10 months? Uh, I don't want to go into how we are able to identify, uh, uh, to definitely determine that. So what, determine what? Board confirmed the person of interest left my way lounge and restaurant with Fleming late into the night. I don't want to go into how we were able to definitely determine that. Well, because he said he did, too, right? Like, uh, he literally told you. That's interesting that this house is here and this one's there, and then My Way Lounge is right in between. They might, might want to look into other instances. Those are lights.
Yeah, who saw him though? That's what's interesting. There must have been another, maybe another uh, business over here had a camera as the car drove away and then he admitted that he picked her up. Police were in Pierce's home on Division Street on Wednesday, but Board said he could not discuss what investigators were doing there. Board said the investigation was continuing, but did not have any major developments. Multiple search warrants. You know what's weird is I remember reading the 12 year part, but not the, like I didn't remember his name. Maybe I hadn't got to that part yet or something. So I didn't even know know that but the 12 year part I was reading about no way I think that was in the earlier article yeah it said he was there for 12 years so yeah never mind on Friday Parkersburg police said that early in the investigation the person of interest told them Fleming was in his car he now declines to speak with them investigators are asking Parkersburg residents to review home surveillance footage for a vehicle you know what's interesting he's a cop he should have known immediately not to have mentioned that she was in his vehicle. Thank you, Texas Annie. Don't you think? Or not speak at all? I mean, you know, he's an officer. He should know. But he probably thought he was busted on that part. So he needs to be truthful on that, but then decided because of that, he will not talk to the cops anymore because he knows that immediately makes him a person of interest. So he's been honest, but now he's not going to talk. So I think that's kind of how it worked. The investigators are asking Parkersburg residents to review home surveillance footage for a vehicle that has been connected to Fleming's disappearance. Oh, investigators are asking Parkersburg residents to review home surveillance footage for a vehicle. What, what year? When was this? Oh, that was way back in January that his name got out there. Hmm. No. Yeah, so at that point, there would have still been surveillance footage out there, maybe. So they're asking people of the area to review home surveillance footage for a vehicle that has been connected to Fleming's disappearance. Police believe the vehicle may have traveled through the Parkersburg area between the early morning hours of December 4th to noon on December 5th. Fleming recently moved from North Carolina back home to live with her grandparents. She was 27 years old at the time of her disappearance and turned 28 on Christmas Eve. Fleming was officially reported missing on December 12th by her family. Board encourages anyone who thinks they may know something, no matter how small, to call the Parkersburg Police Department at 304-424-8444. So it's 100% that guy, okay? Like if I did a poll right now, it, here's what it would be. Let's say we have, I'll tell you exactly what it's gonna be here. Watch this, hold on a second. So in the chat, put a one if you don't think it's this guy. <laughs> honestly, I mean, and do it honestly. Don't be jackassery shit, just type it in. Just for once. Why are polls so fun? No, uh, put a one if you think that it's not this guy that got her out of the bar. What do you mean? I didn't ask you to type in a half, Sean. Who in here doesn't think and the fact that you put a half is scary as shit. Now watch this. I'm going to do a poll here. And let's see. How many people do we have watching? We have 261 people watching. I'm going to guess that at least 60 of them are trolls. And it'll be at yeah, 20% are going to say that they don't think it's him. Okay? Watch. Let's do it.
Um, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Here we go. See, the only people saying no are just people that want to be contradictory without using their brains. That's how it works on social media. I don't think so, Gray. Why would a cop do that? Because he's a psycho. He's the last one to see her, admits to having it. Why, how come there's no story on what happened to her after he was with her? Because he doesn't speak about it. And look at the numbers, everybody. Look at the numbers. How can I predict so much like that? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I mean, isn't that incredible that I can do that? Because if you put that in front of a hundred rational people, they would be a hundred to zero. Now, would I be able to convict somebody on this information? No. But the it's so logical, just like the he's the last one to see her. He says he drove her, and then he clammed up and didn't speak to cops ever again. And she uh, somehow, she left her purse there, and he's an ex-police officer. I think they should take away his pension if he has one. All right, so we've got 59 votes. That means there's only, let's see, 10% of that is 6 so there's only nine idiots in here. That's good. I like that. At least ones that wanted to admit to the idiocy. They're idiot, um, what do you call it? Idiot dumb. <laughs> Gray, I used to like you, but when you called me an idiot, I had to leave. Well, then you are one. Do you understand, you fool? Okay, just look in the mirror sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely hilarious. People get offended when you call them an idiot for being one. All right? Now, I'll tell you what. You can all call me idiots if it turns out that that guy had nothing to do with it. But I guarantee it that he has something to do with it, that her going missing. But someday you could say, See, Gray, did you hear that? Look what Gray said when people said, Okay, awesome. But when you look at the information that's available right now, that's it, man. That is the answer. The Golden State Killer was a cop at one time. Yeah, we knew that. Yeah. Now, there's 15000 in reward money. I think I thought I saw it get up higher than that. Breaking up is hard to do. Breaking up is <laughs> That's right, that's right. If you don't like my channel, just get the hell out of here. Breaking up is hard to do. Yeah. There are uh, posts of people who have encountered him saying how disgusting he is. Okay, who cares? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, of course he's a disgusting person. He probably killed this lady. At least he knows where she is. He is responsible and knows exactly what happened to her. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, that's just total um, stuff like there are posts of people who have encountered him saying how disgusting he is. That's like that stuff you see on, um, you know. I, 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 don't, I don't even know what that means. I'm a... I'm re a different case. I don't know what that means. Sorry, dark horse. No idea what that means. Hey, human trafficking case. Would you help that person get justice for? Do they? 
or do they have to be dead before you will bring awareness? Well, I don't know, Dark Horse Justice, but have you ever watched this show before? You, you sound like a lunatic that just showed up, and uh, we, especially since we're covering a missing person case right now. Would you help that person get justice, or do you have to be a dead before you'll bring awareness? <laughs> oh, God. Why would you need to bring awareness to somebody, uh, you know, if it's a solved case that they're dead? You know, it's, uh, we sometimes go over those because there's interesting cases out there. God, what in the hell? Where, where do these people come from that just show up like that? We're covering a missing person case right now on the screen. Da, 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 da. Are you angry at me? Hey, Zozo. Are you angry at me? Let's just get out of here. <laughs> Don't ask dumbass questions. <laughs> there you go. Hey, that's right. Hey, hey, Dark Horse. Don't ask dumbass questions. There you go. Thanks. It's been a weird week. Just a lot of weirdos showing up with weird comments. Ding, 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 ding. All right, I'll ask Zo. Uh, thanks for sending me the link but that had the name Zozo. And let me see one of the comments that say how disgusting he is. Right. Yeah, I cover everything in here. Uh, Cold, old cases, missing persons cases going on right now, cold murder cases, um, unidentified bodies. I mean, give me a break. So you almost feel like when somebody comes in and says that, they're just a troll right off the bat. You know, why don't you get to know something or go look at a playlist or something and maybe figure it out. You did. You heard that song. Um... And Grits for Brains here shoots him. Did you hear what I said? Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> Grady Judd's the best. Okay. Let's not kid around. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 Oh, so that's what Zozo says. I said, who cares? So she said, you said, who cares? So you can't see them. <laughs> I always get punished if I don't go, wow, that's so interesting that somebody out there thinks that he's gross. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to, if, if there's somebody out there that actually came in, um, like, you know, showed up in the chat and said, oh, I met him the other day, then I'd think, oh, that's cool. But anybody can type anything on Facebook, you know? People just type whatever they want to type. So that's the thing is it's hard to believe anything that you read just randomly on Facebook. So that's where I come from on that. Become a channel member and help make a difference. Help with charity donation. Yeah, so the thing is is I take a huge portion of the income and um, donate it to charity because I want to. Uh, they can't put anything on the internet that isn't true. Well, that's true. Yeah, I heard about that. The fact checkers. Yeah, I said, hey. <laughs> uh, what did I say? Let me see one of the comments. She said, no, you said who cares, so you can't see them. <laughs> oh, my God. But that happens all the time. That isn't something new. If I, if I don't like everything that she puts out immediately, I get a, a negative, uh, the, the link is deleted or something, and I never get to see it. Hey, it's Juniper's Tarot and Magic.
Okay, let's see. I get she did send me one. Hold on. He's a reason to date here like that. Okay. Okay, this is one this is one of the ones that she said. It said He's the reason the daycare I work for stopped allowing DoorDash. We didn't want him around the kids, not that anybody that wasn't a parent was allowed inside. Well, did they know, though, he was a suspect and that's why they thought of him differently? Or was it just their natural thought about the guy? Like, like I mean, wouldn't most of you, let's say you were told somebody, oh man, they're part of the disappearance, and then they show up delivering something? Wouldn't you be like, oh God, he's a creep? Wow. Or, or did you did they naturally think he was a creep before, or I mean after? Well, I guess it's before. You know, without knowing who he was, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we didn't want him around the kids. Not that anybody that wasn't a parent was allowed inside. So we would tell him to park on the other side of the parking lot, put the curtains up, and meet him buy his car not safe for us I know but we wanted him away from the kids he would make comments about how beautiful me and my co-workers were and even showed up with a gun at one point and kept acting like he was going to grab it when my co-worker told him that he couldn't door dash there anymore because uh, he made everyone uncomfortable I think he could see the location before he agreed to the order because within seconds of placing it, he would have already agreed to it. I lost so much money from realizing too late. I didn't like looking away from the kids. I'm not sure how they lost money, but I didn't like looking away from the kids for too long because I had a room full of one year olds and you never know, you never knew what they were doing. Or what they were going to do next and dropping the order before he could get there my friend finally called DoorDash and provided every screenshot and they fired him oh man that's <laughs> yeah I mean why don't you figure out something else other than DoorDash because now you've made it more angry at you guys and they fired him and told us that he had multiple similar reports uh, that one attachment is removed for some... It, uh, I can't see the one. The second one that you sent. I had a... I had to teach sex ed to the first... For the first time this year. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> and by the way, thank you up there to... Junipers, Tarot and Magic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's DoorDash again, huh? Oh, wait, where was he? Was he in um was he in Idaho back in November last year? Seriously, man. Think about it. Was he was he in Moscow, Idaho? <laughs> Is he the killer and people actually have those moments. They'll they'll look into it. How about just say no, you know, like before you do anything, just in your mind, just go no. And don't waste your time. Uh-huh. Oh, it's so quiet. All right, well, that was it, you guys. Uh, pretty interesting story she was here and then late in the morning hours disappeared with a 55 year old ex-police officer who said yep I took her somewhere gave no explanation of where she went or you know if he, if he got out of the car whatever happened and now he doesn't talk to the cops hey. I'm just reading some of the comments. They don't seem to be related to anything. They're just talking about teaching and hellos and chat disconnected. Please wait while we try to reconnect you. Okay, now I'm back.
So let's do that one from the other night that was... What do you mean, yikes, you sent me an email? Is that scary to send somebody an email? Oh, yeah, I, I put all the Arius ones on private, if that's what you're asking about. Because, I mean, they're just sort of to watch, you know. Um, is, that so what, is that what you emailed me about? Yikes, I sent somebody. Sent me. I didn't get an email from you, Texas Annie. I'm looking. I didn't get one. Oh wait, maybe I did. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's an old story that you just sent me, right? I'll just check it out later. So I'm going to do the story from the other night when we were playing newspapers.com. And you kind of you can probably remember this one. <laughs> it's pretty wild. So it says woman body found in locker room. I think this is the original one that we found I can't remember who did this search was that you Eugenie sounds like one that you would do the nude body of a I don't know slim woman neatly sliced into four parts was found yesterday crammed into two cheap suitcases and checked into the uh, busy public locker room in Brooklyn a preliminary autopsy showed no marks of violence on the body beyond the actual butchering. Authorities said the woman may have been poisoned or strangled, a head, torso, and arms all um, something like connected were found in a black imitation leather suitcase in locker number 216. Remember that was the one? Uh, Assistant District Attorney Louis Andriozzi and Detective Charles Kaiser returned last night from Albany where they were searching for Pascal Donofrio, 38-year-old house painter, wanted in connection with Brooklyn's Dime Locker toast Torso murder. Andriozzi said that Albany police had located a second hand, a second hand, <laughs> I almost thought it was like second hand, <laughs> a second hand, because he was... Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I'm, it's not really funny, but it's funny. You know what I'm saying? I'll be back if you want me to. What a way to go. Uh, yeah. Hey, thanks, Cali Gal 3. Uh, with Kaiser and Andre Andriozzi was William Martin, assistant superintendent. What did it say up there? Had located a secondhand clothing store where Donofrio had bought a suit of clothes and were checking dry cleaning establishments to see if he had brought in a blood-stained suit. All right, so they're on to somebody. And January 1st, search press for suspect torso murder. 
William Martin, Assistant Superintendent of Albany Hospital, will return to Brooklyn probably at the end of this week to view the remains of a woman believed to be his sister, Dorothy, Dorothy 36. Meanwhile, police continued their search for Pascal D'Onofrio, a house painter, who is alleged to have lived with the victim in a furnished room at 135 Fort Greene Place. I think this is in, let's see where that goes. One thirty five Fort Green Place. There it is. Brooklyn. It's actually been to Brooklyn. Walked over the bridge. That's probably the same, I would imagine. Right there. Assistant District Attorney Louis Andriozzi said that when Martin returns, all the persons needed to make a legal and positive identification will be a be present at the Kings County Hospital morgue. All right, so that was. Let's just move it forward to like the tenth or so. So here now he's been arrested. A torso killer believes certain to beat chair. He thought. You know, uh, a 24-year-old suicide guard was placed late yesterday on thin, gloomy <laughs> Pascal J. D'Onofrio, 38, Brooklyn confessed torso killer in Raymond Street Jail, though the chances that the shabby strangler would beat the electric chair and even life imprisonment were admittedly overwhelming. Why is that? Well, probably like a second degree. So there he is right there. Look, look at this weirdo, man. He looks like an alien or something. Huh? Uh, painter admits torso slang of Dorothy Martin. The 38-year-old D'Onofrio wearing red pajamas and a robe was captured Monday night as he attempted to scramble through the skylight of a Brooklyn rooming house. He was questioned through most of the night by the Brooklyn District Attorney and New York Police Commissioner Thomas Murphy. He was arraigned later in in felony court. Uh, so, anyways, they got him. They got this guy. Yeah, but on the 25th of February... Landlady Powell held as her slayer. So, the middle-aged blonde caretaker of a caretaker of a converted Brooklyn brownstone was was found beaten to death in her one-room apartment yesterday, diagonally across the street from the rooming house that was the scene three months ago of the torso murder of Mrs. Dorothy Martin. The victim, Mrs. Alice Arner, 50. Wait, is this something else? Landlady? Oh, that's him right there. Lloyd. Wait, not somebody else. How come it's Mrs. Dorothy Martin? Is this a different person? Landlady's pal held as her slayer. Now it's right there. The, I go the torso murder. So it's just right across the street? <laughs> that's just bizarre, man. A whole nother murder right across the street. Uh-oh. Maybe that Pascal guy didn't do it. New York, January, uh, Pascal D'Onofrio, 39, the dime locker torso killer, pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter today in the death of Dorothy Martin, 37, former Hudson Valley Apple Blossom Queen of Sagardis. Brooklyn Judge Carmen... Marasco held the house painter without bail for sentencing. At an unspecified date, he faces a possible term of 20 to 40 years. D'Onofrio originally pleaded uh, in innocent on January 18, 1951, to a murder charge. Thank you, WNC Granny. Hey, at least we're over almost 60% now.
prosecution contended he strangled Miss Martin and his common law wife during a drinking bout. <laughs> so now they're just saying, oh, it was from drinking? Ah, screw it. That's okay. Don't worry about it. The prosecution contended he strangled Miss Martin, his common law wife, during a drinking bout, November 25, 1950, in the Brooklyn apartment they shared. Her body carved into four pieces and placed into suitcase. Jeez. Was found December 4th, 1950 in two dime lockers in a Brooklyn railway station. The hands and teeth were missing and the body went unidentified for three weeks man so he tried to make sure she wouldn't be identified the girl's mother mrs john martin wife of the sagardies postmaster failed in the meantime to receive her usual christmas card from her, the daughter and notified police she might be the victim police visited the apartment found bloodstains and a few days later arrested d'onofrio they quoted him as saying he had not intended to kill the woman. He said he became frightened in finding her dead when he sobered up and that he cut her body. <laughs> Man, this is exactly what our our uh, poem that we wrote about, uh, you know, the song, Rockabye Baby. That's exactly what this is right here. He said he threw the hands, which once had been fingerprinted for a minor offense, into a garbage wagon and the teeth into an ash pile so he could not, so she could not be identified. Jesus. Psychos. Then, believe it or not, there was an actual write-up on the damn thing in 2020. In 2022, actually. And there's a better picture of him. Look at, look at this weirdo. Man. That guy was born ready to kill. He, he just looked at himself in the mirror and said, I'm killing. So let's just see what this quick little synopsis is here. <laughs> he saw himself and said, I am worth nothing but for killing because I am a psycho. Uh, like he did most mornings, Raymond B. Smith waited for the commuter crowd to thin out before starting his routine of clearing out lockers and the bustling Long Island Railroad Terminal on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. It was Smith's job to check on the dime a day lockers, empty them of any items uh, left behind, and store the contents in case the owner returned to claim them. On a warm December morning in 1950, the baggage attendant was making his usual rounds when he made a most unusual and unpleasant discovery. Inside a locker, near the entrance to the train platform, was a cheap imitation leather suitcase. The adjoining locker held a, small, a smaller battered case. Both gave off a sickening stench that made him gag. Yet Smith was more angry than alarmed. It was a Monday morning, his first day back on the job, where a week-long vacation, from a week-long vacation, and he figured that while he was out, his co-workers had neglected to check all the locker banks. And now, someone had left behind luggage, likely filled with some sort of meat that had turned revoltingly rotten. Smith carried the heavy suitcases to a storage room and was about to toss them in the garbage when he let his curiosity get the better of him. He grimaced from the smell as he opened the larger bag. Inside was what appeared to be a large slab of beef wrapped in sheets of newspaper stained with dried blood. Smith gingerly undid the bundle, then staggered back in horror. The suitcase contained a woman's head and torso. Her hands and legs had been chopped off. Smith didn't bother to open the other bag. 
Uh, that was left to Brooklyn detectives who swarmed the station searching for clues to identify the victim of a grisly crime that stood that soon had a herd of reporters snooping around the scene. The other suitcase held the woman's legs, but her hands weren't in this bag either. It was obvious the killer was trying to prevent her from being identified, and investigators saw her teeth were missing too. They weren't pulled out or broken off, meaning the victim probably wore dentures. Now, butchered redhead found in two lockers blared the headline of a lead local story in the Daily News on December 5, 1950, as investigators hoped the woman's description would lead to her killer. The Brooklyn Medical Examiner's Office determined she was about 30 to 35 years old, 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighed about 130 pounds. Her hair was reddish, bordering on blonde, and her nose was short and broad at the base. She also had an appendicitis scar. She had been strangled before being chopped up and stuffed into the lockers, the body parts concealed for at least a week as more than 800,000 unsuspecting commuters walked by. Detectives were stymied for nearly a month as no one came forward with information. This was written by uh, Robert Dominguez from the New York Daily News. Uh, detectives were stymied by nearly a month as no one came forward with information on the dead woman, nor did she match any missing persons reports. The holidays passed without any movement in the case. Then came two simultaneous breaks that turned up an ID and a suspect. In late December, a woman in Sagartes, New York, a sleepy upstate town on the Hudson River, contacted authorities to say the dead woman might be her stepdaughter, 35-year-old Dorothy Martin. Martin came from a good family. She was the daughter of the Socrates postmaster and sister of assistant superintendent of Albany Hospital, but she had seemingly lost her way years ago due to a heavy drinking habit and moved to Brooklyn. The family rarely saw her. Still, Martin always sent her father and stepmother a Christmas card, except for this year. The woman was convinced Martin, a redhead, was the unidentified victim. She wore dentures too and had a scar from a bout with appendicitis. The stepmother also mentioned that Martin had long ago taken up with a ne'er-do-well ne named Pascal D'Onofrio, who drank as much as she did. Desperate for leads, Brooklyn cops were getting set to follow up on Martin's, on, on the Martin angle when, uh, let's see, what is that right there? Uh, when an, an announcement arrived later in, let's see, imploring them to check out a local guy who suddenly took off right after his common-law wife disappeared. The tipster gave police a name and address, Pascal D'Onofrio of 135 Fort Greene Place, a house painter by trade with a record for burglary. He had, until about a month ago, lived with a woman named Dorothy Martin, the tipster said. The building was around the corner from LIRR Terminal. Police were too late. D'Onofrio had moved out in the middle of December, whereabouts unknown. In early January, Martin was publicly identified as the slain woman and the missing D'Onofrio was named as chief suspect. Another tip revealed that he had been uh, lamming it right under cops' noses all that time. On January 8, 1951, D'Onofrio was traced to a Brooklyn flat only a f few blocks from his former residence and was nabbed by police in his pajamas while trying to flee up a ladder to the roof. Uh, interrogated at the Grand Avenue Police Station, D'Onofrio confessed to killing and then dismembering his live-in lover, but swore it was an accident. They had been drinking heavily on the night of November 25th, a Saturday, and Dorothy was getting loud and out of control, he said. He put his hands over, over his mouth. He, 
that he put his hands over her mouth, is what it should say, to quiet her, but they slipped to her, they slipped to her throat and she grasped for breath. He admitted to being drunk as well and told cops he put a cold cloth on her head to revive her before passing out. When he found her dead in the morning, he panicked. <laughs> Isn't this exactly what that, you guys remember the, those poems we did, right? When he found her dead in the morning, he panicked and decided to hide the body. He cut her up with, hack, with hacksaw and a painter's knife and tossed her hands in the back of a garage truck later that day. Her dentures and his bloody bathrobe were tossed in an uh, let's see, ash can a few blocks away and the tools he used to cut her in pieces were thrown into another garbage can. See, I always think people like that. <laughs> But isn't that exactly the same as the stories? That's just incredible. I always think people that do this should be put in prison for 20 years just for the, your ability to do that. That means you're nuts. He cut her up with a hacksaw and painter's knife and tossed her hands in the back of a garbage truck. Her dentures and his bloody bathrobe were tossed in an ash can a few blocks away and the tools he used to cut her in pieces were thrown into another garbage can. On Monday morning he walked to the LIRR station carrying the remains of his girlfriend and stashed them there where they were found a week later. He flung the locker keys in a nearby sewer. Despite his confession to the gruesome crime D'Onofrio escaped a death sentence. A year after he was arrested, he pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter and was given a life term instead. Just the story has been the daily news. Okay, so anyways, that was it. Crazy, huh? <clears throat> so what do, we, what do I do? Do I have to spin uh, around on my head to get, get us up to the gold tonight, you guys? Do some uh, dance a jig, or is just one of the nights? Just one of those. Now uh, let's see. Yeah, we have a whole um, a whole bunch of MP3s that people sent in. Zozo even did one. <laughs> people, uh, we had to do a poem to the song "Rockabye Baby." about this exact topic where somebody panics and chops up somebody's body and uh, tries to hide him doing that. <laughs> it's so funny. That's exactly the same thing. Uh, Dan Carr is the one that won, though. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that what you said too? <laughs> yeah. But what is it, an hour and forty minutes? I thought that one I have is so long. If I could try it, maybe I'll see how far I can get into it. But it's reading again. And we already see how things are going. Um, I think he's doing. I've uh, I've emailed him a couple times. He's having some just sort of these life issues stuff going on. He'll probably be back someday. I'll just, I'm just going to save this one. It's too long. It's more like a Sunday or Saturday type thing. So I think I'm just going to call it a night, you guys. I appreciate you guys being here and everything. Hey, I, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, Dark Horse. Your original comment was so idiotic that I, I, it's going to be a hard time reading anything that you send me.
Yeah, I don't care what you feel like. I'm, I'm just going to block you from here. I don't, I don't like the way you talk. You've never been here before, and you don't know anything about anything that we do here. We're the anti, completely the opposite of everything that you just typed in. And that just means you've never watched. So you're trying to do this little soapbox thing where um, nobody cares what you're saying because we don't do any of those. All right. Yikes. Yeah, don't, don't don't worry about what she's talking about. Okay. No, she's not. She's talking about just missing persons as if we Man, I don't think people need to be to die before they're covered. Yeah, she made another comment earlier. And it was like, "Well, no, we we cover I'm in the as a matter of fact, I'm covering a missing person case right now." You didn't see her original comment. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, no notebooks, no nothing. <laughs> but I let me go to this thing over here. Yeah, the day crew, man, they just nail it every time. Pretty weird. Um, so thank you to Danielle, Cindy J, Jessica Schubach, Allie Kate, Kathy Chapin, Sarah Beth Colagras, Circa Then, K Me, Mickey Duff. Eugenie, Lisa Murphy, Caligal 3, Delva Johnson, was looking good there for a while, Texas Annie, Ju uh, Juniper, Terra Magic, Caligal 3, and then WNC Granny. Yep. All right, you guys. Thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. And, as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector, thug rejector. I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector. And I'm always gonna be a pop protector. Fool deflector, interceptor. And I'm in a man of with a vector. On his pector, with all respect, y'all. Just remember, I've a temple fucking check, I have no agenda. I'm a pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without a blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send you. A mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody. Talk to you. Be safe out there. Yes, everybody. Be safe out there.